Yeah, I think we are connected now on Facebook Live. Yeah, we can start. Okay, we welcome our viewers uh, once again to the session today, uh, which talks about whether, uh, as devotees, do we uh, worship Krishna versus other gods? And Pratik decides he is taking this very controversial topic. He's taking through this the philosophy that Vaishnavism offers us, and uh, we have a couple of slides. So last, this is the third session on this topic, and Pratik decides we had last time brought us to a point where he spoke about uh, Mahakal Dham. Mahakal Dham is where Shambhu resides, and this is uh, it's it's like somewhere in, in between the spiritual and the material. It comes at the borderline, and uh, Pratik decides he would you like to uh, write us through and take the yeah. top ahead. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Rajivri, for again Thank hosting you, the show. And uh, it's always a privilege to be a part of the show. Um, yeah. So I would request you if you can share the screen so we can continue sure. from the last class where we stopped. Okay. So we bring in the Mahakal Dham. Yeah. So just to brief the audience. <laughs> What we have covered till now is in the last class. Um, yeah, the topic is can pure devotion to other gods uh, lead us to mukti? And then uh, what I have covered in the first class is uh, what is this bhakti and bhakti, how it is only directed towards Ishwar Tattva or uh, the Supreme God or Vishnu Tattva basically. And then I did explain the different types of Tattva about Krishna's uh, Tattva, Vishnu's Tattva, Shiv Tattva, Jeev Tattva, Jad Tattva and Shakti Tattva. And then we started discussing about uh, the position and uh, the location of planet, the position of Sadashiv, Shambhu and their respective planets in the spiritual world as well as in between the material and the spiritual world. So I think uh, I have covered all these points in the previous class. And uh, we were majorly discussing and showing from the Goloka chart. So I also showed that how Goloka is the topmost planet uh, in the spiritual world. And then below Goloka is uh, the abode of Lord Ramchandra, Ayodhya. And then below Ayodhya is the abode of Lord Vaikuntha, uh, Lord of Vaikuntha, Lord Vishnu. And below that is uh, the Viraj River or the Karuna Ocean which is the border between the material and the spiritual world. And Mahavishnu or Karuna Dakshai Vishnu is lying on that causal ocean and um, how the creation takes place. So what is the position of Sadashiv in the spiritual world, also called as Ishana, in which direction the creation takes place and uh, the expansion of Sadashiv in the realm of Brahma Jyoti, uh, which is called as Mahakal Dham. Um, and the expansion is called as Shambhu. This Mahakal Dham is, so because it's a abode of Sadashiv, half of that abode is actually in the spiritual world and half of that is in the material, in the, in the Brahma Jyoti. And that's why you'll see that the Mahakal Dham here, represented here, it's actually black in color because uh, it's the color of Pradhan. It is black. And Sadashiv Loka is actually illuminated by the Brahman effulgence. So this ocean, Karuna Ocean, is actually covering that Brahman effulgence. And that's why it's the border between the material and the spiritual realm. So we have discussed all these details. And then I think uh, we also discussed how Mahavishnu is glancing at Ramadevi. Ramadevi is actually the concept of uh, Lord Vishnu. And Ramadevi is actually the chit potency of the Lord, the Shakti Tattva. So Shakti Tattva, so I, I guess that we also discussed about uh, Shakti and Shakti Man, the male and female aspects of God. Did we discuss last time about Shakti Tattva also? I think so. Energy and energetic. No, we did not uh, cover that much. Okay, so let me just uh, again explain something about the Shakti Tattva. So Shakti Tattva is generally as we, sometimes we also call as Durga, sometimes we also call as Rakshmi, sometimes we also may refer as Saraswati Devi. 
but the original shakti of the lord uh, resides in goloka uh, in the form of shrimati radharani and because goloka is the highest planet so radharani is actually the highest form of that shakti and just as krishna expands in the material world in the spiritual world of vaikuntha ayodhya and uh, um, in the material realm also so similarly uh, radharani also expands um, in the form of uh, sita maiya and then uh, lakshmi in in vaikuntha and then um, in the uh, the goddess of the demigods in the material realm and similarly she also expands in the form of rama devi so shakti and shakti man these are inseparable just like sun and sun rays which is inseparable from each other so similarly the lord possesses shakti now this is a vaishnava concept that um, because we believe that the lord is a supreme person so every person is uh, possessed with uh, energy and uh, that's why the lord is actually the possessor of energy he is called as shaktiman and that shakti aspect of the lord is actually referred to as the um the uh, the female aspect of the lord because generally the shaktiman is the enjoyer and shakti is actually the enjoyed uh, so they are taking the role so in in a loving relationship one has to take the role of enjoyer and one has to take the role of a enjoyed now many times it happens that the roles are also reversed in fact actually the nature of krishna is such that especially you know when it comes to lord krishna um, because there is a lot of sweetness in his past times uh, madhurya ras is there that's why the roles are reversed to a lot of extent so in that case shakti actually enjoys more than shaktiman and uh, the shakti enjoys becomes the enjoyer and shaktiman becomes enjoyed but still it is always because of the um, um, you know uh, ultimately the absolute enjoyer is actually shaktiman only but by the uh, power by the mercy of the shaktiman shakti can also become the enjoyer uh, many times so especially this is true in krishna leela whereas in other leelas uh, generally it is lord vishnu and some other form of god who is actually shaktiman so shakti is actually the female aspect of the lord and it is non separable and it is the energy um energy of the lord so like you know many times we say that behind every successful man is a woman so similarly this this concept has actually been implemented from the spiritual principle uh, in the material world also we see there is a reflection so the entire material world is actually the perverted reflection of the spiritual world that's how we can actually understand that uh, a male and female aspect is also existing in the material world so this is a logical reasoning because this aspect is transcendental divyam in the spiritual world so uh, man is created in the image of god like that uh, we have uh, male and female in the material world also but to order in order to understand uh, the transcendental aspect of this male and female it is rightly put in the category of uh, energetic and energy that's how we understand someone because we are also part and parcel of the supreme lord we are also jeev tatva jeev shakti and we are also shakti so we are also actually female irrespective of our external designation because this body is just a external covering of our soul it's a gross body it's going to anyways it is going to be destroyed at the time of death so then the atma is going to take another form in the next life and that can be a female form also that's why the soul by nature it's always shakti of the lord uh because the soul is also enjoyed by the enjoyer so and and the soul is also shakti of the lord so that sense it is actually a female aspect of the lord so we are all actually females in comparison to the supreme lord who is a male like that we can say that god is both male and female because he exists simultaneously in the form of male and female aspect shakti one and shakti like that so this expansion of shrimati radharani in this karuna ocean is in the form of rama devi and uh, Rama Devi is the concept of Lord Karuna Daksha Vishnu, who is lying down in this causal ocean, and he is glancing at Rama Devi. So he is kind of impregnating Rama Devi. So uh, this glance from this halo of the glance of Mahavishnu, Shambhu is actually um, so Shambhu appears. So Shambhu is actually a Shiv Tattva, as we discussed earlier. That uh, Shiv Tattva uh, is neither a living entity, Jeev Shakti, nor is a uh, vishnu tattva or the controller the absolute uh, supreme controller ishwar tattva is in between whereas in the spiritual world uh, ishana or sadashiv is a vishnu tattva that's that's also a form of lord shiva but in the vishnu tattva so 
can you show that Ishan also? So this Ishana, as we have discussed, we I also explained the Avaran, uh, this, uh, exp, you know, the Avarans, the various layers of Avarans around uh, Lakshmi Narayan. Um, and uh, we'll see this in the Vaikuntha chart, which is about this uh, material realm. Yeah, so if you can zoom in. We discussed about the different uh, uh, different different forms and avarans covering Lakshmi Narayan in different layers. And at the end, we saw that how Ishana, this particular Ishana is actually the Dikpal, one of the Dikpals of Vaikuntha. And uh, so, it's, so these Dikpals are surrounding the abode of Vaikuntha in all directions. And Ishana is also Sadashiv, which is actually a Vishnu Tattva. Other forms are, uh, they are the internal, uh, the inner covering of uh, uh, covering of Lakshmi Narayan is actually by Vasudev Sankarshan Pandi Manura. And these are Vishnu Tattvas. Whereas the outer coverings, they are Jeev Tattvas to a lot of extent. And the, uh, the Dikpalas, they are all Jeev Tattvas, yeah. except Ishana, which is Sadashiv. Okay, so let's Continue now. This one, one query yeah. here. This, uh, the inner layer and outer layer, now we see Ishan comes on the Can outer most layer. Down? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear, but if you can speak louder. Yeah. So I was saying that Ishan, as we see in this chart, comes on the outermost layer. Hmm. Whereas uh, we are having Anirud and Pradyum. They are immediately on the next layer. They are much closer to the core, isn't it? So, is, is this forming some kind of a hierarchy that Ishan in hierarchy comes much lower down? Is that is that what this means? Uh, so, yeah, yeah. In, in fact, actually Ishan, I, 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 maybe I forgot to mention that Ishan is actually the expansion or maybe I did mention this point that uh, the Second Dvitiya set of uh, Chaturvyas, Vasudev, Sankarshan, Pradyum, Aniruddha. So they are surrounding Lakshmi Narayan. And from Sankarshan, uh, also called as Maha Sankarshan, expands Mahavishnu, who is at the causal ocean. At the same time, also expands in the form of Sadashiv. So it's a simultaneous expansion of Sadashiv as well as Mahavishnu. So you'll see that. Uh, yeah, that's why Ishana is also in, in the according to Sanatan Goswami from the Brihad Bhagavatam Rit, he explains this point that in Sadashiv Loka, in the abode of Ishana, in the Vaikuntha planet, uh, Ishana is actually worshipping Lord Sankarshan, uh, who is actually Vishnu Tattva, who is Vishnu, Lord Vishnu. So the second set of uh, Chaturvya. So Lord Ishana, Lord Sadashiv. He's having, he's performing Arti of Lord Sankarshan. He's always remembering Sankarshan and he's praying to Lord Sankarshan for empowerment and all that. And then there are associates of uh, Ishan Asadashiv in his abode, like Ganesh Parvati and uh, Nandi and all, all these other associates. Other. So they are all performing Arti to Lord Sankarshana and they are praising and glorifying Lord Sankarshan. So Ish, uh, Sankarshan is actually the Ishtadeva of uh, Ishana Sadashiv. So that's how the, you know, it is the expansion of Sankarshan from the Dutiya Chaturvya. Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah, so the creation takes place in this direction, in the northeast direction, and uh, the simultaneous expansion of Ishana as well as Karuna Bhakshaya Vishnu. Okay, so now let's go ahead. Can uh, again go back to the Okay, so uh, this is the golden egg, which is so when when Lord Mahavishnu or Karunodakshaya Vishnu, when he excels, then from his pores, many golden eggs they emanate. So these are all Brahmandas, these are all universes. And uh, 
yeah, these are all the universes which are there in the material world. Now, there are millions of universes which are emanating from the pose of Mahavishnu, from the body of Mahavishnu. So, I did explain one thing that uh, Mahavishnu is when he is glancing to Rama Devi. In, so, in that glance, there is hello, and that hello, Shambhu appears, and then Shambhu is carrying the trident, which is basically the uh, it is indicating past, present, and future. Trikal, the trident. Okay, and then uh, Shiva Shambhu is also carrying those jivas. So, um, Mahavishnu somehow indirectly he is giving the jivas to Shambhu. So, in, in, and then when Shambhu touches the rope, which is basically touches Pradana, then that transforms into Mahatattva and basically impregnates the jivas uh, by, with the help of Maya, Durga Devi. Okay, that's how the jivas are actually carried from uh, the body of Mahavishnu to this material universe. And so now there are millions of universes. In each of the universes, uh, Garbhadakshai Vishnu enters. So now this is another form of Vishnu which enters in the material universe. So, see, basically, in a simple and, uh, and um, easy to understand way, we, we can say that for every body, there is a soul. And soul is actually the pervading consciousness in the body. Without the presence of soul, the body cannot do anything. So when the body dies, we know that, uh, like, you know, if there is no soul, then obviously the body will not be able to function. So similarly, the entire Brahmanda has to function initially. So the Sarga creation is actually started. It is uh, instigated by Mahavishnu's glance. That's why he's actually the Paramatma of the Brahmanda, the entire totality of the universe. So that's so there are basically there are three forms of Paramatma. One is Mahavishnu, then Garbhadakshai Vishnu. Now all these golden eggs are there, but in order for them to function. There has to be some Paramatma also. Again, there has to be some soul inside that. So, Garbhada, so Mahavishnu expands himself in the form of Garbhadakshai Vishnu. And then he enters each and every uh, golden eggs or universes. Again, now these golden eggs, they are actually covered by all these layers of Mahatattva. Because when Shiva is impregnating um, Durga Devi with Jivas, so he also touches, he comes in contact with Pradhana and then that transforms into Mahatattva. And that Mahatattva is actually the ingredient for all the material elements for this creation. So this Mahatattva is providing earth, water, fire, air, either the Pancha Karmendriya, the Pancha Gyanendriya, the five Tan Matras. Um, and then, um, you know, so like that, it is providing all the material ingredients to the universe. So this golden X starts getting covered by the layers of material elements, earth, water, fire, air, and then we'll have the um, ego and the Mahatattva, like that. Okay, so you'll see the seven layers are here. Um, the brown one, the, the violet one, then the yellow one, and the light blue one, the gray one, um, the light black, and the dark black one. So these are the seven layers which are covering the golden eggs. Okay. And so you'll see here, it is mentioned Prithvi, Jal, Agni, Vayu, Akash. And then Mithya, Ankar, Ego, and then Mahatattva. So now in some cases, it is there are actually eight layers because uh, the layer of Pradhana is also there. But because Pradhana is uh, not visible, uh, it is unmanifested state. So that's why generally we consider as seven layers. Right. So earth, water, fire, air, then either, and then we have ego, and then uh, we have Mahatattva. Okay. So so mind and mind and intelligence they are covered in Mahatattva, like that. So we'll we'll have the five gross elements, and then we have the three subtle elements: earth, water, fire, air, either five elements, gross elements, and then mind, intelligence, ego. So ego is shown separate layer and Mahatattva is shown including intelligence and uh, mind. Okay, so seven layers like that. So by the uh, Mahatattva, all these layers are covering the golden eggs. Okay, so now let's go a bit uh, below.
Yeah, so now here you can see Garvadakshay Vishnu enters. And now what happens after the uh, en entrance of Garvadakshay Vishnu into this uh, Brahmanda, uh, Adi Devtas appear. So Adi Devtas they appear outside the shell of this covering of this universe. And somewhere close to Maha where Mahavishnu is lying. In, in like near Garbhadaksha ocean and they start offering prayers they start glorifying uh, Garbhadaksha Vishnu and that prayer is also very popular and it is called as the Purusha Shukta prayers which is mentioned in the Upanishads uh, and then there is the Naran Shukta prayers also so can you can you yeah can you go about about the coverings about the layers Yeah, so somewhere near the uh, somewhere near Mahavishnu, all these Adi Devtas they are appearing. Now these Adi Devtas, so they are not the Devtas which are manifested in the material world. Agni, Vayu, Chandra, Surya, and all these Devtas, they are not the ones which I am mentioning. Adi Devtas are the ones which are appearing before the Devtas of the material creation. Because I have not even spoken about the manifestation of Brahma in the material creation as of now. Brahma has not even manifested himself. So there is another Brahma who is one of the Adi Devtas, and that Brahma is also called as the uh, Brahma, Brahmanda. It is also called as Brahmanda. Okay. So, so this Brahma, then uh, the other Devtas. These are all expansions of the Avaran Devtas who are surrounding the Vaikuntha, Lakshmi Narayan. So, if you remember, we did show Agni, Vayu, Varuna, Yama, all these Devtas were there surrounding Lakshmi Narayan in Vaikuntha world. So, these Dev, Adi Devtas, they are expansions of those associates of the Lord from Vaikuntha. And they are empowered personalities who are appearing. These are not yet manifested in the material, so we are not talking about that. And see, the interesting thing is that uh, like, you know, we say that the devtas in the material world, like, you know, they are uh, we, we say that, okay, sometimes they resemble the uh, associates of the Lord in the spiritual world. So basically, the spiritual in the spiritual world, the associates of the Lord, they bestow the same form in the, the, to the devtas in the material world. Okay, so like for example, Ganesha. So we know that Ganesha has an elephant head. Now, this Ganesha is also present in the Vaikuntha, which we also saw. Then there is also presence of Parvati in the of one of the Avaran devtas surrounding uh, Lakshmi Narayan. So this same form is given to the uh, demigods in, in the material realm. That's why they resemble them. And uh, but actually, originally they are all expansions of these associates of the Lord from Vaikuntha. Okay, so anyways, these Adi Devtas are expansions, and then the expansions of the Adi Devtas, they are in the material realm, inside the material realm. So after Brahma is born from the navel of Lord Vishnu, from the Garbhosh, Dakshai, um, you can you can see. In the material world, inside the universe, you will see that Garbhasthai Vishnu is uh, from his Garbha, that stem of lotus is actually emanating. And then Brahma is appearing from that stem. Okay. So, these Adi Devtas, they perform, they, they uh, glorify Lord Vishnu, Lord Garbhasthai Vishnu, and they appeal to Lord Garbhasthai Vishnu to appear in the form of Shirashai Vishnu, the third Paramatma. Which resides because see now the universe has got Garbhadakshaya Vishnu, the Paramatma. The, the Paramatma of the universe is Garbhadakshaya Vishnu. But then what about the Paramatma inside all the living entities? That has not yet appeared. And without the appearance of that Paramatma, it is not possible for the Jivas to manifest in the material world. And all most of the demigods they are all Jeev Tattvas. So that's why these Adi Devtas they are praying to Garbhadakshaya Vishnu for the appearance of Paramatma Shirodakshai Vishnu. So you'll see here, inside the universe, there is the abode of Shirodakshai Vishnu on the left side, uh, near Dhruv Loka. 
that's Lord Shiva Shri Vishnu, the super soul, also called as the super soul or Paramatma, in the heart of each and every living entity. So now, by the appeal and uh, prayers of Radhi Devtas, Shiva Shri Vishnu manifests from Garbha Shri Vishnu, and then Brahma is coming. The Brahma in the material world comes by the stem of lotus, uh, the lotus flower stem. And then Brahma meditates, like, you know, we know that how he is unable to, he is not unable to see anything because the universe is completely dark. So then he starts praying, he is like, you know, meditating what to do and he is not getting any answer. And then uh, in his meditation, he hears a voice tapa. So then he starts uh, performing some austerity and then he is able to get some answer from within. So he is actually informed by the Lord, instructed by the Lord to create. So Brahma then starts creating uh, the entire universe. So what happens is uh, the stamp disappears and the entire stamp transforms into the form of 14 planetary system. So here you will see uh, yeah, can you put that into the center, the 14 planetary system? Okay, yeah. No, 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 zoom in, zoom in. You can zoom into the 14. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. So here you will see Satya Loka, the abode of Brahma. Then below that is Tapa Loka. Then below that is Janaloka. Loka. Below is Mahar Loka. Then there is Swarga Loka. Then Bhuvar Loka, Bhur Loka, Atal, Vital, Thutal, Talatal, Mahatal, Rasatal, and Patal. Okay. So these are the 40 planetary system. Now, what is where, where is the position of the hellish planets? So can you go below? Below, below Patal. Yeah, so you will you'll see Narloka. It is mentioned Narloka. 28 hellish planets are it is mentioned. So these are, you know, small, small planets below Patal Loka. This is the hellish planet. Okay, and this is, uh, okay, now can you again put the fluidity planetary system in the center? Yeah, so Patal Loka is not considered amongst the hellish planets. No, no, no. It is not. It is not. Narloka or Hellish planet, these are separate planets where Yama is residing and where he is actually punishing all the living entities who perform sinful activities. So they are taken to Narloka. Uh, actually, in this Goloka chart, obviously, they cannot uh, include many informations. right? So here they have just mentioned Narloka, but in Bhagavad cosmology, uh, they have some, you know, some kind of uh, physical form they have shown. So anyways, but uh, so now where is our, what is our planet and where is our location? So that is actually Bhur Loka, Prithvi Loka. Okay. Manushya Eva Anya Nashwar Pranyoka Lok. So this is our planet, which is Bhur Loka. Above that is Bhur Loka, Pret Atma Oka Loka. So ghostly beings, Pret Atma and all these, they recite Gandharvas and all that. I think uh, they recite the planet Bhur Loka. And then now, again, uh, there is a cosmology, there is a structure of this entire universe, how it looks like. We are not covering that in detail now, and we cannot show it now, because then it, it, it will take many classes in order to show that. But just in order to understand what is our position in the material uh, realm, we are showing this chart. So here is Bhuvar Loka, uh, Bhuvar Loka, Prithvi Loka. And then above that is Bhuvar Loka, Swarg Loka. Swarg Loka, Devta, wherever the, you know, uh, Devtas, they reside. Then there's Mahar Loka, where Bhrugu Muni or Prajapatis, they reside. Jana Loka, Prajapati Loka, and then the four Kumaras in Tapa Loka. So basically, whoever is like, a, you know, Brahmacharya, Vanaprastha, Sanyasis, they, they actually attain these abodes. And then Satya Loka, Brahmaji Loka. So, Generally, the sannyasi is attained Satya Loka, like that. Um, so, this is the 14 planetary system. And uh, again, now inside this Bhur Prithvi Loka, we actually, you know, it, that's also a very huge, vast, um, the, it's a huge, vast, you can say, planet in one sense. And one of the subset of that planet is actually Earth or, or Bhumandal. 
which is actually we are not showing right now, but uh, maybe in the future class we can show. So in that, like, you know, it is basically uh, Jambudipa is there and then Jambudipa, uh, in that Jambudipa, there is the nine divisions. And the ninth division is actually called as the Bharat Varsha. There are nine Varshas surrounding Jambudipa. And uh, one of the ninth division is the Bharat Varsha. And then in the Bharat Varsha, there is Bharat Khanda. Again, Bharat Varsha is divided into nine parts. And then in Bharat Varsha, Bharat Khanda. Bharat Khanda is again divided into, uh, I think, nine parts. Maybe eight, nine, I, I don't remember exactly. But again, the last portion of that is actually Bharat Khanda. The Bharat Varsha, Bharat Khanda. So Bharat Khanda is actually our Earth planet. Like that. So that can be, maybe in the future class, we'll show that... Um, visual form of that uh, but anyways and now this again uh, you know different sections of this planet they are divided and then the, uh, there is actually the existence of Lord Sh now see again Shiva this particular Mahakal Sambhu Shambhu Shiva is actually again expanding in the form of Rudras in this material world inside this universe so brahma like you know we know that uh, actually from the left of garbhadakshaya vishnu comes uh, you know it, it is said that it that brahma is created from the right vishnu is created and then brahma by his anger he creates rudras so one of the rudras is actually shiva in the material world so there are 11 rudras some are shiva tattvas and some are jiva tattvas so Jeev, jivas can also attain the position of a rudra but they cannot become they cannot attain the position of shiv tattva or they cannot attain the position of vishnu tattva but they but one of the rudras can be a jiv tattva also so generally in the material world these are shiv tattvas which which are at different different phases for example the kailash mansarovar in the material world it's actually the shiv tattva presiding and then in Ilavrat Varsha also, we, uh, I cannot actually explain this concept because uh, we will have to see the visual form of that. But in one of the Varshas, uh, in, in the Jambudipa, we will also see that Ilavrat Varsha is the center most Varsha. And in that Ilavrat Varsha, Lord Shiva resides with Parvati. Because there is a description of Lord Shiva residing in Ilavrat Varsha um, along with Parvati in the Srimad Bhagavatam. So that Lord Shiva in Ilavrat Varsha, Lord Shiva in Kailash Mansarovar, these are all different personalities. These are again the expansions and forms of Lord Shiva in this material world. So there are, so you now see someone can understand the concept that, okay, it's not just about one Shiva and what form of Shiva is also there. So there's the Shiva Tattva and there's the Vishnu Tattva uh, form of Lord Shiva, right? So the entire purpose was to actually show that Shiva is actually an expansion of the original Ishana Sadashiva, is expansion of Sankarshan. And then Sankarshan is actually the Dutiya Chaturvya, which is the expansion of the first Chaturvya, which is residing in Goloka. So see the position of Shiva and see, see the position of uh, Krishna in the spiritual world. Right? Um, so, okay, any, any questions from uh, this uh, chart, from this material realm? Yes. yes. Uh, so here in the ninth loka, there is Vital. Ninth loka is Vital. Oh. Ah, there it is written Rakshasoka Lok. And yeah. there it is mentioned Shivji Yaha Nivas Karte. Correct, correct. So see, there is another form of Lord Shiva, which also resides in Vital planet. So these are uh, seven planets. So, yeah, yeah, but my question is that. It's coming even two levels below Prithvi. So Shivji is situated below Prithvi level, that means? Yeah. So see, that does not matter because uh, even like, for example, Vamandev at, in the planet of Sutal Loka. So you will see Bali Maharaj kya lok, Vamandev yaha nivas karte hai. So even Vishnu is also residing in Sutal Loka because he is actually very attached to his devotee. So 
because Bali Maharaj is the pet favorite devotee of Lord Vamandev. That's why Vamandev personally, and that's also the assurance that Vamandev actually gave to Bali Maharaj. In the Bhagavatam, we know that. So Vamandev, now see, this Vamana, we also saw a, a Vaman in the spiritual world. Vaman form, right? In the 10 incarnations. So again, these are expansions of the Supreme Lord. Uh, it's not just about Lord Shiva, but even the Lord himself is expanding himself in the material realm. Like for example, you'll see, uh, can you show the layers? Yeah, so okay, you, you can zoom in. So you see here, Prithvi, see now these seven layers also, they are personalities. They are, see everything is personal actually in this Vaishnava concept, everything is personal. That's why these material elements also, there is a presiding deity for them. And uh, for the planets, for the stars, there is always, some, for the nakshatras, there is always some presiding deity. This is a personal concept, personal understanding. So you'll see that here, Prithvi, Sakar Roop mein Bhagavan Vara ki puja karti hai. So Vara Dev is also residing in this layer. Then Jal, Jal Sakar Roop se Bhagavan Matsya ki puja karte hai. Phir Agni, Sakar Roop se Surya Narayan ki puja karte hai. Vayu, Pradyumna ki puja karte hai. Akash, Anirudh ki puja karte hai. Ahankar, Sankarshan ki puja karte hai. Or Mahatattva Vasudev ki puja karte hai. So Vasudev, Sankarshan, Aniruddha and Pradyumna. See all again, all these four Chaturvyas, they are again worshipped here in this layer. And the three of them, uh, Vara, Matsya and Narayan, Surya Narayan. Right? So these are all personalities. And again, these are abodes. It is described that you know they have also palaces and um, many other opulences in these layers. So that's how, uh, you know, when Gop Kumar actually oh. went, he penetrated the layers of the universe. So he came across all these things. And then finally, he actually at, uh, went to Vaikuntha like that. So these are all personal personalities uh, residing. And that's why you'll see that we also have the concept of Paramatma in each and every aspect of the creation of the universe. Right? So we have the some totality of Paramatma, Mahavishnu, and then, so like a universal form, you know, Paramatma in its universal form, then Paramatma in the localized form, in the form of Garbhodakshay Vishnu, and still in the subtle form, in the localized form, it is uh, Paramatma in the form of Shirokshay Vishnu, who is actually residing in the heart of all the living entities. So everything is made very personal. There is no question of impersonalism. See, you will see that everything is are covered yes. with a personality here. Right. So, so that means the Lila of Bali Maharaj, where Vamanda, Vamandev comes and he places his foot <laughs> on his head. That Lila happened in uh, uh, Vitalok only? No, no. That happened in our uh, Bhur Loka, Prithvi Loka. Um, okay. If you remember, when there was no other uh, option to to place the feet of Lord Vamandev, then Bali Maharaj himself offered him to Vamandev. And he told me that you can place the, you know, your third step on my head. So then when he placed, Lord Vamandev placed his lotus feet on the head of uh, Bali Maharaj, then because of that uh, heavy pressure, he was actually uh, pushed down to Sutal Loka. Like that it is mentioned in the Bhagavatam. Oh, that means Uttalok is within Prithvi only in, in a deeper layer yeah, inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, it is inside. So that entire, uh, all these details are actually uh, visible in the Bhagavad cosmology chart. Spe you know, when we focus specifically on this 14 planetary system, then we can show that chart. Oh. Yeah. Um, so once again, maybe I can uh, try to just share one particular image of that. Yeah. Um, okay. So. One second. Oh. 
Okay, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, so I have a 3D view of that. Uh, let me share it. <clears throat> Yeah, can you all see now? I so you I see, I will stop, stop my screen share. I, we can't see it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now I'm, we can. Yeah. Okay. Now you are able to see. Uh, yeah. So seven lower planetary system. You see Atal, Vital, Sutal, Talatal, Matal, Rasatal, Patal, and then there is some extra portion of Earth inside, and then here are the twenty-eight hellish planets. You see a small um, slate, like you know, kind of thing they have shown here. So that is actually the uh, abode of the. It's not exactly like that, but uh, there are, there are different twenty-eight hellish planets in that. So this is a cross section of the Bhumandala, okay. And uh, the exact dimension of each and every loka is also shown. So it's in the form of yudna. One yudna is eight miles. So sixteen thousand yudnas, and then ten thousand. Yudnas is the uh, uh, atal, the uh, dimension of atal, the height of atal. And then below, so between one and two, is there is small gap of 500 Yudnas. So like that, uh, they have shown the cross-section of this. Uh... So, so since this is within the three, is it possible to travel into that? Because here you don't have to do interplanetary. Yeah, yeah it is possible. So it's possible in a subtle form. So basically it is said that those who are in the mode of ignorance, they reside in the lower planetary system. Those who are in the mode of passion, they are residing in the earthly planet of Bhur Loka. And those who are uh, uh, have prior spirits, they attend to the heavenly planets, Swarg Loka. But then those who are austere, they are renunciates and they are, uh, you know, they, they all attain the planet of uh, planet beyond Swarg Loka because they don't desire heavenly enjoyment. They desire to be renounced. They desire to meditate and do austerities. So they attain the planet of Maharloka, Tapaloka, Janaloka, Satyaloka, like, like that. Uh, let me see. But, there... but liberation can happen. Yeah, so... I got one, one more. I think uh, this can also help to visualize to a great degree. Uh, one second. Okay. So first, let me show the aerial view of our uh, Bharat Varsha, Bharat Loka. So are you able to see? Yeah. So you see, this is the Bharat Khanda, the earthly planet here. And this is actually Jambudipa, the Dvipa, the first Dvipa surrounding Mount Meru. This is a golden Mount Meru, Sumeru, also called as Sumeru. And this is the Dvipa which is immediately surrounding uh, Mount Meru. And then here we see that there are different Varshas. Now, what is the difference between Dvipa and Varsha? Dvipa is some a land which is surrounded by water. And uh, Varsha is a land which is surrounded on two sides by mountain. Okay. So, here we'll see that on one side, or is Kuru Varsha, then uh, Hiranya Varsha, Ramayaka Varsha, Ilavrat Varsha, which I was talking about, the center of Mount Sumeru, Ilavrat Varsha. Then Hari Varsha is there. Then Kim Purusha Varsha is there. And then we have the Bharat Varsha. And then there are nine divisions of Bharat Varsha, which is the southernmost tip of Bharat Varsha is our Bharat Khanda, this earthly planet. You can see here, right? And uh, these are all respective. So see, there is a Himalaya in the material world also that we, uh, in the earthly planet, Himalaya mountain that we can have access to. But actually beyond that, there is, you know, uh, which is at the borderline of Bharat Varsha and Kim Purusha Varsha, there is another Himalaya mountain whose width and height is 2,000 2, Yojanas and 10,000 Yojanas. So see, this Himalaya mountain is not the same as the mountain that we see in our earthly planet. So again, it's the, it's a, you know, you can say the, uh, the dummy version of that. In, in so the, the projection, is this the projection of that onto our Prithvi Loka? And we can say like that, not exactly uh, the same, but uh, 
yeah i mean I, in the more subtle form the real himalayan mountains actually the 2000 and 10000 kilo uh, yodnas um, which is the border line between uh, bharat varsha and kimpurusha varsha so see now this is just jambu dipa and then then surrounding there are many dipas so let me show that also Yeah. Yeah. Are you able to see? No. Okay. One second. So this is a top view of. Uh, see you in the center. You will see the Mount Meru, in the small blue one, yeah. blue portion. Here you will see the Mount Meru is there. This is the top view, and then we have the Jambu Dipa, which is surrounding. But but then there is also the salt water ocean. Then there is the sugar cane juice, right, which is immediately followed by the Salmali Dipa. Plaksha Dipa is the first. Then Salmali Dipa is the one. Then Kusha Dipa. Then Kronja Dipa, then Shaka Dipa, uh, and then Mansatar Mountain will start. Pushya Dipa is there, and then we have the Golden Land. So this is actually a detailed, uh, you know, uh, we have also seen in the Bhagavad Cosmology okay. seminar that uh, one of the devotees had conducted in my house, right? So this is a detailed uh, picture of the top view. and uh, that's how we understand that uh, it's it's a very where we are staying is just a small insignificant portion of the entire creation right okay so so bia yeah, i i think we can just go on now um, go ahead because uh, these are all very technical details and it will right. require multiple sessions to explain each and every concept okay so now we have understood thoroughly the different forms of lord shiva different forms of lord vishnu different forms of uh, the associates of the lord in the material realm and how the demigods they are actually given the forms of their associates of the lord in vaikuntha so these are all jeev tatvas in the material world so as i told earlier that jeev tatvas they cannot become shiva tatva and they cannot become vishnu tatva so there is no question of worshiping indra varuna surya chandra yama these are all jeev tatvas they are all actually kind of devotees of the supreme lord so as i said earlier bhakti is only meant for the ishwar tatva vishnu tatva now uh, having said this it means that bhakti can only be directed towards krishna vishnu shiva right and it cannot be we can not say that bhakti can also be directed towards uh, durga okay i mean we can direct towards them but they are all shaktis of the lord they are all uh, enjoyed by the lord so but prabhu ji yes you, you mentioned adi devatas hmm so adi devatas are also jeev tatvas of the same because adi devatas Uh, have their counterpart in the material world yeah so are the devatas they are the they, they are the expansions of uh, the the avaran devatas from vaikuntha so that's how they are empowered jeev tatvas you can say like that or or they are also endowed with the shakti of the lord because in the spiritual world you must have the shakti also the lagini and the samvit potency has to be there so you can say that they are empowered expansions of the associates of the lord from vaikuntha but the demigods in the material realm they are um, they are jeev tatvas which are empowered by these adi devatas to function in the material realm to to manage to take that responsibility see uh, ultimately even the material world also even in our earthly planet also we see that there are some positions like prime minister or some someone who is very rich someone who is very uh, powerful so again they display some portion of 
the power of the supreme lord opulence of the supreme lord so in that sense also they are kind of indirectly empowered because without the mercy of the lord no one can do anything without the empowerment of the supreme lord no one can actually because they don't have that much power with so without the proper mercy of the lord they cannot do anything in the material world that's why indirectly they are empowered to some degree so similarly the demigods the jeev, jeev tatvas in this material world when they are empowered by the adi devtas they take the form of demigods in this because they are taking responsibilities on a much bigger scale not to just speak of a particular country state they are taking responsibility of the entire creation or the entire universe in a, a particular universe so that way there are billions of universes and that's how we have billions of brahmas millions of demigods and then millions of expansions of the supreme lord also in all these universes so all those millions of billions of brahmas are finally the expansion of that one adi devta which is one brahma yeah so these adi devtas again yeah so they empower all these brahmas in in all these universes like that right right yeah so okay. we have millions of garbhadakshay vishnu we have millions of shridakshay vishnu much more than garbhadakshay vishnu and then we have millions of brahmas and all these demigods in the material world like that yeah so coming back to the point of bhakti yoga so bhakti yoga is directed only towards ishwar tatva vishnu tatva right so bhakti can be now so let's try to figure out can devotion to can pure devotion be directed towards lord shiva also can it be directed towards durga also now see as i mentioned earlier that durga is actually expansion of rama devi and rama devi is expansion of uh, sankar uh, the concept of sankarshan and that is an expansion of lakshmi narayan and that again is an expansion of the first adi chaturvya in goloka and that is expansion of shrimati radharani in goloka right so you can see what is the position of durga in this material world and you can see the position of um shrimati radharani so vaishnava concept especially um gaudiya vaishnava concept or nimbar nimbarka charyas uh, vishnu swami concept uh, sorry um rudra parampara in sampradaya concept and vallabha charyas vishnu swami concept they all talk about shrimati radharani's existence and how she is actually the supreme concept of lord krishna right but then um other sampradayas and other philosophies they may not present it like that so they someone may say that shakti is actually the highest aspect of the absolute truth or or they they talk about the brahman aspect being the highest but shakti brahm uh, and then shiva and uh, vishnu they are all the different manifestations of that brahman so in that sense obviously this entire goloka chart does not exist in the concept of advait philosophy because there is no concept of personal god there is no vaikuntha in the spiritual world there is no spiritual world at all the entire manifestation is just brahman so you cannot expect that all these uh, vaikuntha planets will be there so see they somehow the advaitvadis or mayavadis they discard they reject this particular injunction of the scripture that vaikuntha there is a reference of uh, goloka in our upanishads also in our vedas also rigved Uh, there is a mention of goloka then there is a mention of vaikuntha in our scriptures so what about that you know how do they show that so they may probably agree that it is existing but probably they say that it's temporary manifestation of that brahman which is not reality because it's all sachidananda uh it's divya it is transcendental this all is mentioned in the scriptures so the chart that we have shown is according to the vaishnav concept vaishnav understanding and that specifically according to the gaudiya vaishnav philosophy uh, and very close to the nimbarka as well as vallabha philosophy the the way we show the chart because they all believe that uh, krishna is the supreme personality of god and he has this planet called as goloka where he is served by all his devotees in madhurya ras so all these sampradayas they agree on that so krishna the god is the highest in the spiritual world now um uh, now coming back to lord shiva so see we cannot have a direct relationship with shakti because shakti is just the feminine aspect of 
the absolute truth. And there are, uh, you know, it is basically the enjoyed aspect of the absolute truth. That's why we don't consider Shakti as the ultimate manifestation of the absolute truth. It is, it, it is in one form, it is the ultimate manifestation, but it is in relation with the enjoyer. It cannot be separated. So there is, you know, we cannot, we do not worship Radharani separately from Krishna. And we cannot, we do not worship Radharani alone. We always worship Radharani along with Krishna, along with the enjoyer, along with the Shaktiman. Because we know, we understand that they are inseparable. We cannot say that, okay, only Radharani is existing or only Krishna is existing. No, Krishna is existing with the Shaktis. The Supreme Lord, Absolute Truth exists with Shakti. That's why they are existing simultaneously. So when we worship the Shakti aspect, we have to also worship the Shaktiman aspect. Now, this is only possible in a personal philosophy. It is, again, you know, when we talk about Advait philosophy, they, they may cover it up saying that, okay, Shakti is just a manifestation, just like other forms of the Lord, Absolute Truth are manifestation. So Shakti is another manifestation of the Absolute Truth. And we can worship and then we can attain moksha. Now, I would like to explain about the concept of moksha in order to differentiate between um, whether pure devotion to Lord Shiva, Vishnu, to whom it can be directed. In order to understand that, I would like to explain some concept of moksha also. You had some question? So, yeah, you just mentioned we never uh, worship Radharani alone. We always worship with Shakti Maan. Shakti with Shakti Maan. But Shakti Man is worship alone. Krishna, we can worship alone. That we do. Uh, I, I, actually, people are not aware of this concept that Shakti Man, when we talk about Shakti Man, we are also including the Shaktis of the Lord. Because then, see, when we remove the Shakti of the Lord, then the Lord becomes impersonal. Because uh, now, again, the form of the Lord also is actually the aspect of the Sandini potency of the Lord. Okay, the you know the reason why we are able to see the Lord is also because of the Samvit and Sandini Shakti of the Lord. Okay, and we are able to experience that relationship in uh, with the Lord is because of Ladini Shakti of the Lord. So when you talk about worshiping Krishna, you are getting some enjoyment, right, by that worship. And then how do you experience that enjoyment without the Ladini Shakti of the Lord? So in order to experience Krishna, in order to see Krishna. First of all, the existence has to be there. That means Sandhini potency has to be there. In order to understand Krishna, Ladini uh, Samrit potency has to be there. So when we talk about worshipping Krishna, these three potencies are always there with the Lord. It's a chip Shakti of the Lord, internal potency. It can never be separated. It's just that people are not aware of this uh, philosophy, Tattva. They want some, sometimes they would like to worship Krishna alone, but it's actually alone, even though they may worship Krishna alone, but Krishna is always along with the Shaktis. So their preference may be Krishna alone, but generally that is not recommended also. I mean, Krishna himself says that uh, one who approaches me directly or considers my, considers, uh, you know, as my devotee is actually not my devotee also. Only when one becomes a devotee of my devotee actually becomes my devotee. So that is very clearly stated in Adi Puran to Arjuna. So this concept of uh, Krishna worship alone, that's kind of misunderstood, but we, we should understand that it includes inclusion of the Shaktis of the Lord. Okay, like that. Okay, yeah, so now coming to the question of moksha. So what are the different types of moksha? So see, moksha, generally it, it is referred in the scriptures as gati. So someone may attain this particular gati. Now gati, is a general category of uh, moksha, general term which is used for moksha, because gati can also mean you attain the higher planets. So like for example, someone who is at Patal Loka, can, maybe he can come up to the planet of our earthly planet, Bhur Loka, and then he can also go to Bhur Loka, or he can also go to Swar Loka. And so similarly, now generally it does not happen because uh, only in the human form of life we can actually go up and down. Otherwise, we are just uh, uh, getting the reaction of our karma in uh, Swarga Loka and uh, in uh, lower planetary systems. So, in the mode, generally, we are in the mode of ignorance in uh, the lower planets, and in the upper planetary system, we are in the mode of goodness, and we are enjoying uh, in that. So, we are exhausting our karma, and then we again come down to the material planet. So, it, that's why it is in between. 
up, down, up, down, like that we keep going. But in the middle only, we can actually decide where we want to go up or below. So that's why free will generally is completely fully manifested in, um, in the middle portion. That's how we go up and down like that. So that's why we, uh, we are passionate. We are in the middle. We are not in the mode of goodness, not in the mode of uh, ignorance, but we are in the mode of passion because in passion activities are there. We make choices. So one can go from lower place to a higher place. That can be called as Gati. One can go from earthly planet to the Swarga planet. That can be also called as Gati. Because Gati means, you know, you are um, achieving some destination. Okay. And then from Swarga, one can also go to, you know, if by the mercy of pure devotee, anything is possible. So one may go to Maharloka, Janaloka, Tapaloka and Satyaloka also. Right. But all these realms are inside the material world. And another definition of Gati or Moksha is that one can attain. Now, generally, Moksha means something which is you, you attain, which is free from the material realm. That's the common understanding of Moksha. Gati can mean it can be within the material realm also. But generally, Moksha means you get free from the material realm because you want to get free from suffering. So then you go beyond material realm and then you have different types of moksha. Now there is a Sayuja Mukti. Moksha can also be called as Mukti. Sayuja Mukti, then there is a Sarupya Mukti, there is the Salokya Murti, there is the Sashti, and then there is a Samipya Mukti. Okay. So these are five different types of Mukti, different categories of Mukti. Uh, Brahman Mukti, to merge in Brahman or to realize that one is Brahman, that is called as Sayuja Mukti. Okay, and these uh, uh, this this type of mukti is attained by those who are impersonalist in nature, or those who are mayavadis, or those who are enemies, demons of the Lord. Okay, and those who are followers of Lord Shiva. So some of them are advaitvads. So they attain this sayuja mukti, or also called as kaivalya mukti, in the Upanishads. So now they believe that this form of mukti is the highest mukti. And other forms of mukti, they are temporary manifestations of. Like, for example, they, when we talk about, uh, we go to Vaikuntas, and then, um, so this is all temporary manifestation, temporary mukti. But we, and so they, according to them, Kaivalya is the highest form of mukti. But we have understood logically that why would one want to attain such kind of state? And even uh, if they would like to attain such kind of state, uh, it does not matter which God is supreme God because ultimately everyone becomes one with Brahman. So there is no question of, you know, there is no, I mean, um, why do we need to bother about who is the supreme? Because anyways, we become one with the supreme. That's why they have the concept of Pancha, Pancha Upasana, Devtas, uh, Brahma, uh, sorry, Shiva, um, Vishnu, then um, Ganesh, then Parvati, uh, Shiva, Vishnu, Ganesh, Parvati and uh, I think it is probably Brahma. So they have these five demigods that, I mean, five gods that they worship and by worshipping these any of these, we can actually attain um, Brahman, like, you know, liberation. So some philosophies, they uh, believe like this and that's why it does not matter who is the Supreme. If they are all manifestation of the Supreme Being. So now uh, this mukti is achieved by those who are impersonalists, who are Advaitvadis, Mayavadis. But then we also believe in the concept of uh, eternal liberation in the form of service to the Lord and, and in the form of residing in the abode of the Lord. So that, then there are other four categories of mukti, which is Salokya, Sashti, Samipya and Sarupya. So Salokya is basically having the same opulence as the Lord. Then Samipya is residing close in the planet of the Lord. Then Sashti is, sorry, Sashti is the same opulence. Salokya is residing in the abode of the Lord. Uh, and then uh, Sarupya having the same form as the Lord. So these are the four different types of uh, liberation which exist in Vaikuntha only because here we are talking about uh, service to the Lord. And these forms can be achieved in the abode of the Lord only. So these are the four different types of muktis. And the fifth category is the Sayuja one, which we spoke about merging or becoming one with Brahman. Okay, you have a question. Yeah, 
Yeah, so there are hierarchies in, even in uh, liberation, in mokshas, which can be considered as the highest of these. Yeah, so it's a good question. See, the thing is, uh, normally a person will not think about Sayuja Mukti. It's not natural for the constitution of a soul. Why? It's a simple reason. If you are happy in the material world, okay, then why do we need to think about liberation? If we are only attaining happiness in the material world. So, one thing we clearly can conclude from this principle is that Liberate Sayuja Mukti is attained, like uh, people attain, want to attain Sayuja Mukti because they want to get rid of su suffering from this world. That's the only reason why they would like to attain Sayuja Mukti. Okay. Uh, otherwise, you'll see that if this life is eternal and eternally we are enjoying, there is no suffering at all. Right? So, same concept also exists in our Vaikuntha planet or in the spiritual world. So it is very natural. So if I ask you, you know, would you like to go to a place where there is pure love and there is eternal happiness? I mean, you continue your relationships. Everyone exists. Everyone is eternal. And you just keep continuing. But there is only the concept of pure love in that. In the material world, we become selfish because of our ego, right? But in the spiritual world, there is pure ego. Realizing that we are all in love, we want to serve each other. That's the only unique thing that we realize in the spiritual world. It's a, see, going from the material realm to the spiritual realm, it's just a transformation of our consciousness. That's it. It's a purification. Nothing else. Like, you know, I mean, so it's very natural for a living entity to be in that state because constitutionally, we want to be happy and we want to enjoy. We want to have relationships also. That's how we are actually created. Now, see, if we believe that the absolute truth is impersonal, then, you know, it does not answer many questions like how do we attain karma? What is the beginning point of karma? How, why we are created? Why we are created in the material world? Because, you know, ultimately from an impersonal thing, suddenly a personal manifestation is coming. And then again, the destination is impersonal. So then why we are directed towards that and why there is an imposition of a philosophy for which we have to, you know, we, we have to follow certain rules and regulations. And just by following that, we will be happy or we'll be attain liberation. Who is imposing that? If absolute is impersonal, who is imposing that? And why does he impose that? Why does the impersonal wants personal oh. living beings to come back to or become Brahman? So you see, it's a completely illogical, I mean, does not make sense in any way. But when we consider the personal philosophy, Vaishnava philosophy, it, it makes so much sense. I mean, I, I cannot claim that it answers each and every question. But you can say that 95% of the questions are answered in Vaishnava philosophy compared to maybe 30, 40 or 50% in other philosophies. Because it, it Vaishnava philosophy talks about personal philosophy, which means that why we are existing? Man is created in the image of God. Because in the spiritual world, there, there are living entities. And here in living entities, the purpose of creation is that the Lord wants to enjoy loving relationship with us. And why there is karma in the material world? Because when we came in the material world, when we separated from the Lord, we started uh, in order to uh, become independent, in order to experience that in being an enjoyer, we started acting in the material world because activity is natural for the living being. So activity existed in the spiritual world and it also exists in the material world. And because activity is natural, we started uh, acting in the material world and through those actions, we created karmas, certain set of karmas, which caused, you know, like we, which causes us happiness and distress in this world. So activities are natural for the constitutional position of the soul. It, it is the constitutional position of the soul like that. So that's how we understand that uh, Vaikuntha liberation is is very easy to understand and natural for the soul to attain, right? But sayuja or impersonal liberation or merging with Brahman, it does not make sense or it's a secondary objective of any form of uh, mukti because uh, people want to get free from suffering. Otherwise, why would anyone think also about liberation? 
so that's how we are actually created in order to experience the bliss such as ananda vigra this is a, a constitutional position of the living entity like that so these are the different categories of liberation and we also discussed about why going to vaikuntha is actually the natural um, desire of the living entity it, it is supposed to be the natural desire of the living entity because of the constitutional nature of the soul so see now let's come to pure devotion to directed towards lord shiva because obviously there is only one god which needs to be discussed here and that is lord shiva uh, because other all other gods they are all coming the category of jeev tatva whereas we also discussed about shakti aspect of the lord which is lord, god is durga so we see that shakti man and shakti has to be a worship simultaneously otherwise then again basically it's an impersonal concept so it does not matter whether you worship any of the gods so now comparison with lord shiva so as we have already discussed lord shiva is existing in the spiritual world as uh, vishnu tatva ishwar tatva uh, also as called as ishwar tatva and then lord shiva is also residing in the material world as well as in between the material and the spiritual world in the form of shiva tatva so this shiva tatva now obviously um generally what happens is now see there are many references in the scriptures that vaishnava scout about whether you know one uh, whether lord shiva can grant liberation or not and the answer is that lord shiva can grant liberation only by the mercy of lord vishnu only by the mercy of krishna otherwise he can independently cannot grant liberation whereas if you consider the shaivite scripture so there are many references of this uh in our vaishnava vaishnavas they have quoted a lot of uh, evidences of scripture but when it comes to um uh, shaivites so what they say that they say the opposite they say that without the mercy of shiva even krishna or vishnu cannot bestow liberation but there is only one reference that i could find out and that also they quote the skanda puran um yeah so this is the uh yeah so they quote this kan puran the yagya vaibhav khand 25th chapter and uh, there is one particular reference to that which in which krishna is telling one of his devotees that if you want to attain true moksha then you worship lord shiva i cannot uh, i neither i nor uh, brahma nor mahavishnu can give that uh, liberation um, okay only shiva can do that whereas now if you consider the vaishnav scriptures there are so many references uh, one one of the references from the hari vamsha puran uh, in the bhavishya parva chapter 80 so uh, there it is clearly mentioned that muktim prarthaya mananam mam punara trilochana mukti prada sarvesham vishnu vishnu eva na samshaya so seeing me asking for mukti lord shiva said to me that the giver of mukti is only lord vishnu of this there is no doubt then there is also another reference in padma puran uttarakhand 229.59 uh, where it is mentioned that vishnu anucharatvam hi moksham ahur manisina the wise people say that devotional service to lord vishnu is known as moksha then in the skand puran now see the same skand puran there is also another reference where it says that mandago bhava pasena bhava pasacha mochaka kaivalya pada param brahma vishnu eva sanatana he binds the soul with the ropes of birth and death he, he unties the ropes of birth and death that bind the soul the supreme brahman eternal lord vishnu alone see here a specific word is used vishnu eva so vishnu eva vishnu alone is the bestower of mukti kaivalya so whether it is kaivalya mukti sayujya mukti or whether the four different types of muktis are there uh, it's all coming from vishnu then there is also another uh, uh, reference from the brihad brahma samhita 3.9.68 which is one of the panchratra samhita lord shiva tells to gautam muni so devo hi mat para sakshat parmatma sanatana narayana asti jagatam moksha da purushottama lord narayan is one superior to me and he alone can give moksha to everyone then further 
3.9.32 Lord Shiva states, Na aham kaivalyado rajan para tantra swabhavata swatantra sarva bhuta atma paramatma ramapati. O king, I am not the giver of moksha. By nature, I am subservient to Lord Vishnu. Whereas Lord Vishnu is completely independent and atma of all the living entities. Then further in the Skand Puran, Lord Shiva tells Kartike, Shiva sahastra dutta grayam bhagavaj shastra yogiyar paramo vishnu evaikas taj jnana moksha sadhanam. <clears throat> then shastranam nirnayastva eshas tad anyan mohanna hiti. The statement of Shaiva scriptures should be accepted only when they agree with the Vaishnava scriptures. Lord Vishnu is the only Supreme Lord and knowledge of him is the part of liberation. That is the conclusion of all scriptures. Any other conclusions are meant only to bewilder the people. So this is actually quoted by Shri Jeeva Goswami in his Paramatma Sandarbha. And this is a verse from Skand Puran, quoted from the Skand Puran, where Shiva is telling Kartike. So now see, again, now there are more references also. Um, in the Kurma Puran also in 1.21.32. Uh, then Harivamsha 3.8.89.5. Then Srimad Bhagavatam, obviously, we know. Then Mahabharata also. Uh, it no, is mentioned. That one uh, instance where Krishna is saying that I cannot bestow and nobody, nor neither Brahma, you have to go to Shiva. How does one reconcile that statement of Lord Krishna himself? Yeah, so see, in now the Shaivites, they also quote. As I said, that they quote from the Skand Puran, uh, the particular Khanda, uh, the, yeah, it's the Khanda Yagya Vaibhav Skand Puran, 25th Adhyay. So they quote this particular, and I have only found one particular verse. Now, see, again, when while quoting verses, also it is very important whether these verses they quote, they are bona fide or not, because uh, sometimes they can claim that, okay, our verses are interpreted or or some verses are included or something like that. But similarly, we can also counteract them by saying that what you are quoting that can also be interpreted or they can also be included later on. So generally, a, a good way to actually uh, find out whether a particular verse is actually authentic bona fide is that that verse should be quoted repeatedly. Um, it should by the Acharyas. If, if that is quoted repeatedly by the Acharya, it appears in different places. It means that it's a genuine bona fide verse. See, that's why, uh, and, and the Shaivites also quote one verse from the Mahabharata, where Krishna is telling that Shiva is actually the greatest and worship Lord Shiva to attain liberation. <clears throat> but now again, Mahabharata is also in one form, it actually it is a corrupt text in, to, to say because there are different versions of Mahabharata in different parts of India. Not each and every story of Mahabharata is the same. If you see the Mahabharata TV series also, you will see that there are multiple versions of Mahabharata. So this has been confirmed by our own Shripad Madhvacharya in his Mahabharata Tatpar Nirnaya. Now, see, it's very interesting. For the Madhva Sampradaya, uh, which is the Brahma Sampradaya, they considered Mahabharata as the main scripture. So in uh, the same Sampradaya, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also appeared and Mahaprabhu gave the Srimad Bhagavatam as the Amal Puran, the spotless Puran, as the ultimate evidence. But uh, Prior to that, Madhvacharya considered Mahabharata as the uh, main scripture, their main scripture. And he had a commentary on the Mahabharata, Mahabharata Tatpara Nirnaya. So we consider the commentary of Madhvacharya to be authoritative because Ma he himself is mentioning in that commentary that Mahabharata is a corrupted text. So I will read a few things um, regarding this. So Madhvacharya, you know, he says that the original Mahabharata is basically lost. There is much that has been added and there is also Sanskrit word for this. It says how verses have been changed, verses have been removed and verses have been added. Therefore, it is very difficult to determine the import of Mahabharata from the existing text of Mahabharata. So, for example, Madhvacharya described in the Mahabharata in Draupadi Swayamvar, Karna went and he also competed, but Karna missed the target. There is no mention that Draupadi stopped him by saying that he is Sutaputra. So Madhvacharya says that this incident did not happen. So when this incident is present in many Mahabharata versions that we see in the television, which is actually probably not in the original Mahabharata. And then the Bhadarkar Oriental Research Institute also worked very hard to prepare what they call as critical edition of the Mahabharata. That means based on existing manuscripts, they tried to find out what was the original Mahabharata by inference. 
they also said that property did not sell like this so basically corona missed the target okay so see this is a very clear indication that because mahabharata itself is uh, it is made in different different versions the serials the stories and all that we hear in different regions in different regions in different different ways that's why even vaishnava acharya also they try to refrain from quoting mahabharata directly they mostly quote from upanishads gita shrimad bhagavatam like that as the authoritative reference so here also the shaivas they may quote the mahabharat in one place and then uh, the skand puran but then these are the only two references which i am able to find out if there are more references where you know krishna or vishnu is saying that only shiva can give liberation so that can be accepted to some extent let's assume that that may also be true but then there are also references from vaishnava side that they mention about um, how shiva actually is he cannot independently bestow no liberation he needs the mercy of lord uh, so in padma puran in uttarakhand chapter 2.16 it is mentioned shiva tells narad muni that tava prasadad devesh mukti da bhavami aham by the mercy of lord vishnu i became capable of giving mukti to others similarly in skand puran the bhagavat mahatmya chapter 3.39 to 42 uh, 39 to 42 chapter 3 39 to 42 text it is stated as follows rudra said oh lord of devas oh my lord i have ample power in in the case of annihilation naimitik uh, nitya naimitik and pra prakritiya types but i do not have any power in regard to atyantika uh, ultimate annihilation liberation of moksha on account of this i am very unhappy therefore i request you so see there is a direct there are uh, other now other references also um in narad panchratar also it is mentioned skand puran again another verse is there then narad panchratar again so there are ample of references that vaishnavas are quoting and generally one ke one may also say that it is said that lord vishnu uh, shiva bestows liberation in kashi to his followers by chanting mantra in their ears that's why lot of people they go to kashi and they perform the last rituals in kashi but here actually from this particular in, um, conclusion it is quite clear that actually lord shiva only by the mercy of lord vishnu or krishna can actually bestow liberation so our acharya special jeev goswami says that how do we reconcile that lord shiva can also bestow liberation he cannot do it independently so whoever comes to kashi the mantra that lord shiva is chanting in their ears is basically the ram mantra the mantra of lord ramchandra now shaivas may not agree with this they say that they may say that well, it's a tarak mantra with the brahma mantra or the uh, you know some mantra from which which basically bestows liberation to brahman or or you know to realize that we are brahman they may not agree with this but it is quite clear from all these uh, evidences from the chart from so now see again from the display of qualities point of view also you will see that vishnu and krishna they are manifesting more qualities than lord shiva so let's let's take lord shiva as someone who with whom you can connect in in a relationship right and then so there are two aspects of worshiping lord shiva one is the aspect of merging in brahman or realizing that you are brahman then in that case there is no consideration of whether it is shiva or durga or uh, vishnu or krishna so let's remove that aspect second aspect is that okay someone may say that where we are followers of lord shiva and we would like to attain a particular relationship with lord shiva and we go to abode of lord shiva in kalash now the question is that where is the abode of kalash that's the question where are we where are you going so even if you have a relationship with lord shiva where are you going in in the hierarchy that we have shown where uh, in vaishnav concept philosophy uh, it is mentioned that generally if the devotion is mixed and and normally the devotion is mixed of many followers of lord shiva so they are they want to attain some power or opulence from lord shiva so they only go in the spiritual uh, in the material planet which is the kailash they cannot go beyond that also in fact they cannot even reach pradhan the abode of mahakal because that beyond the material so see it also depends on the desire of the living entity to where where he would like to go or what is his motivation so generally people they want liberation without practicing anything 
that's a tendency of people they want everything very cheaply so like you know uh, now if you see if you have desire for enjoyment in the material world how do you expect that lord shiva will chant and give you bestow liberation on you at the time of your passing away in kashi that's not it's not possible see because the lord will also respect your free will he will also respect your desire if you do not follow the lord's instruction and if you enjoy in the material world every scripture talks about renouncing the material world ultimately it does not say that okay you just enjoy the material world still you will attain liberation if you want liberation you stop the desire to enjoy in the material world right so that is the minimum qualification so even if you want lord shiva to give you liberation you have to come to the platform of getting free from the enjoyment from this material world that should be practiced in the material world so those people only can actually attain liberation now if, you know even if you see if you tell me that okay would, would you like to attain liberation would you like to attain uh, sayuja mukti i would say that well you know uh, rather than going to sayuja mukti i would actually prefer to be in the material world and enjoy give me opulence give me power give me good health name and fame in the material world that would be my preference so why would i would like to go uh, and attain liberation so one thing we can clearly exclusively remove is the concept of brahman so that even there are they may be followers of brahma lord shiva but it does not make sense you know this uh, yeah, i mean it does not even matter who is the supreme lord now coming to the question of whether you can have a personal relationship with lord shiva if you devote himself purely okay if you render pure devotion service to lord shiva so see there are two answers to this one is that um, according to our vaishnava understanding philosophy if you worship lord shiva if you have attraction to lord shiva then you can attain his planet now which planet so if you consider lord shiva as being the servant of lord vishnu who is the ultimate absolute truth and you know the position of lord vishnu you know the position of sadashiva also with respect to lord vishnu then by pure devotion you can actually go to the abode of sadashiva in the spiritual vaikuntha planet okay so the, the, this can be the destination of the followers of lord shiva if they devote to lord shiva purely and at the same time they know that what is the position of shiva so they don't they don't think that shiva is actually superior than even vishnu so if they think like that then they cannot go to the spiritual world then maybe they can attain they can you know attain they can uh, reach the planet of mahakal which is actually at the level of pradhan but they will not go to vaikuntha spiritual world now again this is a this pradhan the mahakal dham is again in between the material and the spiritual realm so there you know the vaishnava acharya they don't talk about much about uh, the details you know what exactly happens and and now coming uh, to the third understanding is that okay even if you attain mahakal dham If if you have pure devotion for Lord Shiva, uh, now see Sadashiv. If you worship Sadashiv, you know the position of Vishnu and uh, Sadashiv. So you attain Vaikunda. If you are, if you think that Lord Shiva is actually the supreme, you may attain probably Shiv that Shiv Loka, Shiv Tatwa, uh, uh, Shambhu in Mahakal Dham. But then now the question is that what kind of relationship you will exchange with him? Your Shambhu. is not even manifesting the qualities that krishna and vishnu are manifesting in the spiritual world so we have rasas in the spiritual world we have varieties of rasa in the material in the material world and in between there is no rasa there is no concept of rasa so rasa is only meant for vishnu and krishna vishnu tatva or krishna tatva it is not meant for shiv tatva so you may go to that abode but then there is some kind of rati that you may attain it's not even developed actually so like for example we have shantaras we have dasaras we have sakharas we have avatsalaras and then we have madhuryaras in all these categories devotees are actually exchanging loving relationship with the lord with shiva it's not defined i mean uh, one thing is that there is no particular rasa that is defined with lord shiva like you know i have not heard that with lord shiva we have shantaras or dasaras the rasa itself is not defined with lord shiva so how do they explain this concept so now when they talk about extending relation with lord shiva in any of these mellows then they have to come up with a concept of mellow they have to come up with some see where is the scripture it talks about all these details okay you 
worship Lord Shiva, but then there, there are associates of Lord Shiva, you follow them, you serve them, then there is a special type of, because when you connect with someone, then you also have symptoms, you also display symptoms. So all these bhavas, the sattvic bhava, the vyabhichari bhava, these are all not defined with Lord Shiva. So is there a scripture which talks about the rasa with Lord Shiva? That is something which we have not been able to find out. So that's why we'll see that with pure devotion with Vishnu and Krishna, you can attain more intimate results compared to Lord Shiva. So from this also we understand that how liberation with liberation towards Vishnu and Krishna is actually supreme. It is superior. So even though we accept that, okay, by, you know, there are both scriptures. Let's say there are, there is equal weightage in both, on both sides. That Shiva follower of Lord uh, Shiva, they say that uh, only Krishna, Vishnu and Krishna can only give liberation by the mercy of Shiva. And then on the other side, they say that Shiva can bestow liberation only by the mercy of Krishna. Now see, it is very interesting to know. Although they say like that, but from evidence, we can clearly see that Krishna is the only one who actually bestowed liberation to demons. Whereas demons are followers of Lord Shiva. So who is displaying more opulence? Who is displaying greater qualities in the form of the Supreme God? It is very clear that Krishna is exhibiting these qualities in a much higher way. So that Gati that someone attains, Krishna directly bestow, can bestow Sayujya Mukti, not just that, but he can also uh, bestow Prema Bhakti to the demons. We are not talking about the followers of or the devotees. So you now, okay, again coming to the point, the reason why Lord Shiva is glorified in the scripture as supreme, you will see that these are the Tamogun scriptures, Raja or Tamogun scriptures, but the Satwagun scriptures, they do not do that. They glorify Vishnu as the supreme. And we understand that you know, amongst the gunas, we understand Sattva guna is actually superior to the Raja and Tamogun, right? So we, from this also, we understand that how Vishnu's position is supreme. Uh, considering another concept is that, see, the scripture, if when we are dividing the scripture and then we are directing the people in different gunas to different, different personalities, it's a fact, you know, it's, it's obvious that people, they have to worship that particular uh, personality as a supreme. Because if it is mentioned directly that, well, I am not the supreme, Krishna or Vishnu is the supreme, then who is going to worship Lord Shiva as the supreme? So when people, they are in a particular guna, they are accustomed to worship the Lord in their particular guna, in their particular mode of nature. So for example, ghostly beings, um, then um, many other people who are in the mode of ignorance, they would like to worship a personality in their similar gunas. So they identify that Lord Shiva is someone who is actually displaying these gunas. That's why, okay, Shiva is the supreme for us. So you see, see, that's the reason um, one of the uh, statements quoted by Jeeva Swami from the Skan Puran, where it is said that Lord Shiva is telling Kartike that whenever there is a conflict, contradiction between uh, scriptures in different modes, then we should only, we should align all these other statements by the uh, supremacy of the uh, scripture in the mode of goodness. So it's a logical statement. It makes sense. Because the, the mode of passion and mode of ignorance is inferior to the mode of goodness. It is quite natural. And then we also know that Vishnu is the one who is actually maintaining. And maintenance is actually the most difficult task in creation. To create something, to destroy something is not so difficult. But to maintain something on a longer period of time is very difficult. So again, there is indication that how Vishnu is actually taking that difficult responsibility, more difficult responsibility, right? And then there are followers of Lord Shiva who are actually demons. And ultimately, whenever there is a fight between uh, the followers of Shiva and Lord, then the Lord, uh, they, you know, he will destroy the demons. So they are. So that's why it is rightly said that Rake Krishna Mareke and Mare Krishna Rakeke. Those who are protected by Vishnu or Krishna, they are. They can, no one can harm them in, in any way. No one can. Uh, Lord Shiva also cannot protect them. Uh, okay. And those who are destroyed by the Lord, no one can protect them. 
and those who are protected by the Lord, no one can destroy them. Right? So these are the most important principles, very logical principles also. We can clearly see how Kumkarna, Ravana, uh, they, are, they all took shelter of Lord Shiva, but they ultimately they were destroyed. Some demons took shelter of Brahma, but they were all destroyed by Vishnu or Krishna. So now, now there are also uh, pastimes in Sattva Gun uh, scriptures where it is mentioned that how Vishnu defeats uh, Shiva, Krishna defeats Lord Shiva. And in Tamo and Rajagun, there are, there are pastimes where Shiva is defeating Lord Vishnu. But I have not, not heard till now Shiva defeating Krishna. There was only one fight between them that was during the time of Banasur. So Banasur was actually a devotee of uh, Shiva. And then Krishna actually wanted to destroy Banasur. But because he took shelter of Shiva, because Shiva is very dear to Lord, so ultimately Krishna defeated Lord Shiva and he protected Banasur in order to keep the vow of Lord Shiva intact. So in that fight, according to the Bhagavad Puran, Krishna defeated Lord Shiva. And in number of occasions, uh, Vishnu has also defeated Lord Shiva. Whereas in the uh, Tamagun Puran, it is mentions it, it mentions that Shiva defeats Vishnu. It you know it does not talk about defeating Krishna anywhere. But even if we accept the fact that okay, Shiva is defeating Vishnu, we can understand that these are all leelas. Uh, like you know, there is clear mention of Shiva running after, chasing after Moini Murthu, Murthi Avatar of the Lord, and he is bewildered completely. And in that bewilderment, he, he goes to a point of even discharging semen, which is like you know a great thing to a great extent. He is bewildered, and then Shiva is proudly saying Parvati that you know I am so proud that actually I was bewildered by my supreme Lord. And this shows how my Supreme Lord is actually the greatest. So then Parma Puran also Shiva mentions um, Aradhanam Sarvesham Vishnu Aradhanam Param uh, Tasmat Parataram Devi Tadiyanam Samarchanam that amongst the worshippers of all the gods, worship of Vishnu is highest. But beyond the worship of Vishnu, this is the worship of the devotees of the Lord. So there are many references in the scriptures where um, and then not just about the position of Lord Shiva and Krishna or Vishnu, but then there are references of glorification of Srimad Bhagavatam in other scriptures. In Tamogun and Rajogun, they are glorifying Srimad Bhagavatam, which is completely in Sattva Gun, Sudha Sattva. So, scripturally also, in terms of position also, you will see how Krishna and the Sattva Guna scriptures are glorified. And Srimad Bhagavatam clearly establishes Krishna's to Bhagavan Swayam. Then Brahma Samhita, uh, Ishwara Parama Krishna Satchidananda Vigra Anadir Adir Govinda Sarva Karanam Karanam Advaita Machutta Anadir Ananta Rupam. You know, so logically we can clearly come to a conclusion that how ultimately Krishna is the Supreme. Even beyond Vishnu, Krishna is the Supreme because Krishna is displaying the maximum qualities um, in the form of God. So you know, as, as I said, that 64 is demonstrated by Krishna, 60 is demonstrated by Vishnu, and then Shiva is demonstrating uh, 55, and Jiv Tattva demonstrating 50 qualities. Right? So, Shiv Tattva in between Jiva and Vishnu, and Shiva also in the form of Vishnu Tattva as Sadashiv, who is displaying uh, 60 qualities. And then above that, Krishna displays four more. So, Rup Madhurya, Venu Madhurya, Leela Madhurya, and Prem Madhurya. These four are not displayed by any of the other. So, I, I guess uh, that hopefully, yeah, now obviously, see, there are many references about Krishna and Rama in Upanishad also in our Vedic scriptures, not just in the Puranas, but uh, because some people may also claim that well, your Krishna is only mentioned in the Puranas and Itihasas. But no, there are many uh, references in the scriptures also. Um, and see, another interesting point is only Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita, which is knowledge of the supreme destination. No other gods they have spoken this kind of knowledge. But we have Uddhav Gita and we have Ashtavakta Gita, so they are not similar. Yeah, so ultimately, who is the origin of Gita? It's, it's basically Krishna ah. only. And oh. Krishna, Uddhav Gita is also Krishna speaking to Uddhava, right? So this Gita is popular throughout the world and, and it is considered to be the national scripture also in one sense, of, especially of Sanatana Dharma. It is considered to be the ultimate scripture and even those who are scholarly people, so they give their, they, they would prefer 
to get evidences and uh, uh, references from three things. They would prefer from Upanishads, they would prefer from Vedanta Sutra, and they would prefer from Bhagavad Gita. So Bhagavad Gita again is listed in you know one of the most important scriptures. So um, you see, you know, again, Krishna is speaking the Bhagavad Gita knowledge, and Lord Shiva is not saying Mama Ivamsha Jiva Luke Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. All uh, living entities, they are all my part and parcels. Right? And Janma Karma Chame Divyam Evam Yoveti Takvataha. Taktva Devam Punar Janma Neti Mam So these these things are only spoken by Krishna. And then Krishna also Aham Sarvaswa Prabhava Mata Sarvam Pravartate. Right? Um, so again, it's all spoken. And then Krishna also said, Mata Paratana Nanya Kinchi Dasti Dhananjaya. <clears throat> there is no truth superior to me. So Shiva is not speaking like this, you know, because there is no, see, there is no concept of rasa. There is no concept of vaikunda in the philosophy of, you know, followers of Lord Shiva. Yeah, so, um, So we, you know, in order to understand one thing, you know, if you want to go to the Sadashiva world, then we have to also identify that Lord Shiva is also the servant of Lord Krishna or Vishnu. Because see, it's a very natural thing. Like for example, if if in a family, you have the father at the center, the father is the main person, and then father has children, and then he has grandchildren. So if the grandchildren, they say that, well, I don't accept father or, or your, your father, you know, my, my grandfather, but I will accept you. Then obviously it does not, uh, uh, you know, make sense because although they may consider you as a father and they may respect you, but that respect is not complete because they are removing your um, relation, they are detaching, connect, disconnecting your relationship with your father, and they don't want to respect your grandfather. <clears throat> so how are they going to respect you also? To so one, they may respect you in some other ways, but it's not complete. They are removing some, some portion of that respect. Right? So, it makes sense when the father is in the center, when they identify that, okay, I may be worshipped, that's fine, but then I have my father also. And I double my worship to my father. Right? Um, or the people should double the worship to my father. Because my father is superior to me also. So, if that is the concept if that is the motive, if that is the awareness, then with pure devotion, one can go to Sadashiva Yoga, like that. Yeah, I think so. We have covered almost all the points. Any questions, more questions or comments? No problem, I think that's fine. Yeah, one, one more point just uh, strike me is that, uh, well, in the, in the, uh, Vedas, there is also mention of uh, the attainment of Lord Vishnu's award. And uh, I, I just wanted to share a few of them. So, Rig Veda 1.22.20 states Om Tad Vishnu Paramam Padam Sada Paschanti Surya. All the suras or devas look towards the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu as a supreme abode. Then, Rig Veda 1.156.2 states. Vishnu is the most ancient of all, yet also the most recent. Nothing and no one creates Vishnu, yet Vishnu creates everyone and everything. So there are some similar statements which the Shaivites also quote, they quote about Lord Shiva, uh, which is okay, you know, but, but then if you accept one thing, you have to accept both things also. So we have to reconcile that. And that's why, uh, it, you know, in the Aitreya Brahmana Rigveda 1.1.1, it is mentioned that Agni is the lowest and Vishnu is the highest among Devas. All other gods occupy position that are in between. And then Taitriya Samhita also 5.5.1 Vishnu is the supreme amongst Devtas. It is said the Devas derive their power and position from Vishnu. And he is the source of all gods. He is the supreme god. Then there is the Satpat Brahman of Yajur Veda also. So like that there are many references you know, no one can claim that uh, we are only using the Puranas as references because people mm -hmm. consider Puranas inferior compared to the Shrutis. So we are also quoting from the Shrutis. So in one of the lectures, I heard that uh, you know, there is a 
instance where Lord Shiva and Narasimha they they have a duel, and there uh, Lord Shiva is he is the victor. He comes out uh, victorious. So in that, uh, I think Prabhuji mentioned that in one of the manmantras. Uh, Krishna allows this uh, superiority to Lord Shiva. Okay. There are so many mandantaras, and one of them he allows that. So that is how you reconcile that what is written in the Shiva Puran is also right. But then what is written in the Vaishnava uh, Puran is also is. So that is okay. Yeah, so, uh, see, first of all, I am not aware of this particular past time where Shiva defeated Lord Narasimha. If you have a proper genuine reference, then yeah, uh, it is possible. But again, as I said that there are uh, evidences from Puranas where there, there's a fight between Vishnu and Shiva and Shiva defeats Vishnu. Again, Vishnu also defeats Shiva. There are again evidences in other scriptures. So now, we what we understand is that uh, you know, as a Shiva Tattva or as a Vishnu Tattva, Shiva's position is very, very important. It is very intimate also. And it is, in to some degree, it is not different from Vishnu's position. So they are, sometimes they are just doing this as Leela. They are defeating each other. Yeah. Like, for example, Lord Ramchandra is worshipping Lord Shiva in Rameshwaram. And similarly, Shiva is also worshipping Lord Ramchandra. Right? So both are thinking that they are devotees of each other. So that way, this pastime is going on. Uh, and that is a transcendental yeah. nature of these two. There is no question of they first of all fighting for superiority. That's all we love. <laughs> yeah, so so they are just fighting because they it's all because of their devotees. They just want to please yeah. their devotees to some extent. Right. So they are displaying these leelas. And see, there is no question for a devotee of Lord Vishnu to see Lord Shiva and Vishnu fight. It is all because of the mentality of their demons that they want Shiva and Vishnu to fight. See, that's another point, concept. Right, another logical point. Right. It's very important to understand these things. So we have to know the reasoning also. And in order to demonstrate them the superiority of Lord Shiva, there are certain pastimes which occur like this. And so similarly, the Vishnu Puran and the Puranas, the mode of goodness, they will demonstrate that Vishnu is superior by defeating Shiva. Otherwise, how do you prove that why why it is said that Vishnu is supreme or Shiva is supreme? So then there are certain pastimes like this that will prove the superiority. But then holistically, we have to understand. And then we have to also consider the respective modes of nature of that particular Puran. So which Puran waits more? Although Shiv Puran is there, Vishnu Puran is there, but Vishnu Puran is a mode of goodness and Shiv Puran is a mode of uh, ignorance. So then which will have more weight? right? And then consider the holistic philosophy of the Upanishads, of the Vedas and the Puranas, the Tiyasas. Then we'll understand everything in the right perspective. So that's why Jeev Goswami quotes this verse from uh, Iskan Puran, where Shiva himself tells Kartike that the Sattva Guna should be given more priority and it should be reconciled, aligned with that. Nice. Yeah, so I hope our audience also, if, you know, I don't know if they have any questions or comment about this. Uh, let me just check for two minutes. But um, yeah, I think we have discussed quite a lot in detail. Uh, this is also important because without all this information, people cannot logically understand what we are trying to convey. It needs a uh, elaborate discussion actually. So you know, it's not that we are fanatic, and why you know, just because okay, we worship Krishna, that's why we are worshiping. Um, why we, we you know say that Krishna is a supreme god, it's not because of that. It is. It has some specific reasons. Some it, some analysis is required for that. So this is actually very important. Okay, yeah, there are no questions in our Facebook audience chat. So, all right, Rajiv, thank you so much for your time. Uh, and thank you for conducting the show also. And hopefully, on uh, the next session, we will have uh, some different topic. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Namaskar. Okay, once again.